Welcome everyone to our second annual Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center Winter Speaker Series. I'm so excited we're doing this again. Last year was a real blast and this year is gonna be just as good if not better. A great big ocean of thanks to all of you. As I mentioned, I see so many familiar friends and faces on the screen and names in some cases. Definitely, we are recording this, so if you'd like your privacy, turn your videos off. Um, I am Graham Starsage, for those that don't know me, Director of Development and Programs at the Gibsons Marine Education Society, which operates the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center and Community Aquarium at the Gibsons Public Market. There, are, there may be some people that are tuning in from off the Sunshine Coast or even outside of British Columbia. I welcome them. If you are ever on the Sunshine Coast and in Gibsons, please visit us in person at the Gibsons Public Market. Um, before we start, I ask that we all take a moment to take in a big breath and acknowledge what a crazy time we are living in. In and out, and maybe one more. In and out. From my heart, I'm just so happy we can connect in this virtual world. If the pandemic is teaching us anything, let it be that we need each other. I miss you guys. And for those of you that don't know, I miss not knowing you. <laughs> so again, thank you for joining us. It means a great deal. Our vision at the society is to support an educated community that actively cares for the health of our oceans. We accomplish this vision through operating our community aquarium, delivering K-12 and adult education programs, and undertaking local marine conservation initiatives. To learn more about our activities or get involved further, or donate as we're a charity. Um, I'm gonna put my email in the chat box or at any point if anybody wants to message me privately. That's my job, that's why I'm here to connect with you. But without further ado, I will introduce Victoria Ritchie. Can you wave Victoria so people know we're talking about you? Okay. Um, she is our amazing co-op student from UVic. She will be orienting us further on this presentation tonight. We have nominated her for this distinction based that she's the youngest person in our group and understands Zoom the best. So take it away, Victoria. Wow, thank you so much, Graham. Um, as Graham mentioned, uh, my name is Victoria or Vic. I use she, they pronouns, um, and I'm the co-op student at the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center this uh, semester. I am from the University of Victoria, where I'm studying in the faculties of geography and environmental studies and I'm so happy to be here. Uh, virtual events are very different than in-person events, but I'm really happy that we could all come together and I'm really excited for this talk. And I appreciate everyone coming out. So um, before we get started and introduce our speaker, I would like to take this time um, for, the, the, for the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center. Uh, we respect and acknowledge that our work takes place on the unceded territories and lands of the Squamish nation and Squamish peoples uh, for whose connection to this land and these waters continue to this day. So this is a land acknowledgement and it's very important that we do this, uh, but it's also important that you folks at home take a second to uh, think about whose land you're currently occupying. So since this is virtual and we're from all over, I just have this quick video that I'll play for you folks, um, highlighting a resource that is really helpful to uh, discover whose land, whose territories um, you might be living, working, and learning on. So this is called nativeland.ca. It's a great website. Um, Graham has put it in the chat as well. It takes you to this really awesome map, and you can type in the city or the postal code uh, of your location, and it shows you exactly um, what languages the indigenous people of this area speak, uh, the treaties and the territories of these lands. And so this is a really great resource, um, especially when we talk about the environmental movement. These are important voices to amplify, and so I encourage you all to learn more. 
Additionally, on this slide, uh, if you're from this area here on the Sunshine Coast, uh, in Squamish territory, you can go to squamish.net to learn more about the Squamish Nation. And we've included a couple YouTube videos um, from the Squamish folks themselves uh, explaining their connection to these lands and a lot of the work that they're doing. So thanks for taking the time for that. Oops, there we go. Next up, we have some Zoom etiquette. Uh, so some of you might, might be new to Zoom. Some of you might just need a refresher. For this event, we're asking that folks mute themselves uh, just to respect other people who are listening uh, to ensure we can hear the speaker clearly. We're also asking that you turn off your camera just to make sure that um, we're, we're all able to focus on the screen that's featuring the speaker. Also a note that this recording is be, that this talk is being recorded. Um, so just for your own privacy, we ask that you turn your camera off. Um, and then at the end of the talk, uh, of Garth's talk today, we are going to be doing a question period. So if you think of a question during the talk, you can type it into the chat. Um, or if you have one after the talk is done, type it into the chat and we will make sure that we set aside enough time for um, those questions to be answered. And yeah, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to David Margaret Marmark. Sorry. Uh, David is a senior partner and lead scientist of ESSA Technologies, and he is the chair of our technolo techno Technological Advisory Committee here at the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Center. Uh, so I'm going to pass over to David so he can introduce our speaker today. Thanks, David. Thanks, Victoria. Hi, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Garth Coverington as the first speaker of this fall seminar series organized by the Center. You'll hear more about other planned talks uh, later from Graham. And we're glad to mingle and talk virtually despite the current constraints. It'd be nicer to be down at the Marine, at the, uh, at the Gibson's Marine Center, um, sharing a beer and mingling directly with one another, but that's not possible. So Garth is a PhD candidate at the University of Victoria, where he's studying the sources, the fate, and the ecological implications of microplastic contamination in the marine environment. Uh, Garth completed his Bachelor of Science degree in biology at UBC in 2012. And that's where he first became interested in ecological changes caused by people. After reading Plastic Ocean by Captain Charles Moore, Garth dedicated himself to furthering our knowledge of what plastic is doing to the environment and what we can do to stop it. Garth has a great curiosity and enthusiasm for many things, especially marine ecosystems, and a very thorough, objective approach to any question he tackles. His insatiable curiosity has led him to explore many topics, such as the levels of microplastics in shellfish, including clams and oysters used in BC aquaculture, uh, the levels of microplastics in humans, the need for researchers working on microplastics to standardize their methods, and the sustainability of aquaculture in British Columbia. He's been very busy publishing papers on these topics, working on his PhD, and so we're extremely grateful that he could take the time to prepare and present a public lecture tonight and answer your questions. On a more personal level, our family has known Garth since the day he was born. Uh, Tom and Lori, who are on the uh, Zoom tonight, and, uh, and Betty and I, my wife, uh, met at a prenatal class. And uh, Garth preceded the birth of our son by uh, three weeks. And um, it's wonderful to see how over the last 31 years, Garth has nurtured his inherent curiosity and passion for nature into research that both feeds his soul and helps humanity. Uh, Garth's family, other relatives are on the Zoom call, uh, have a home by the ocean in Roberts Creek. In fact, some of them are probably calling in from there uh, for four generations, which undoubtedly helped to nurture Garth's interest in marine ecosystems 
just as the Marine Education Center is doing for the next generation of local marine scientists. Uh, Garth's also a great rock drummer. His former band was called Reef Shark, showing a bit of marine influence. Uh, and that perhaps has given him some subconscious insights into the tidal and wave rhythms of the ocean and the subliminal patterns in the data that he gathers. So I'm really looking forward to his talk. Please welcome Garth Aiden Coverton. Hmm. Hello, everyone. Oh, sorry. No, it's all good. I'm just going to stop sharing my screen. And so you can take over. Sorry for the okay. introduction. No, that's OK. I'm just uh, getting my screen share going here. Just get my annotation. All right. There's my little laser thing. OK, great. All right, everyone. Um, hello to all of you. And it's great to be here with you today. I have to say, it's pretty wild. I, I give a fair number of these public outreach lectures, um, and especially pre-COVID, I gave quite a few. Um, but I have never been introduced by someone who knew me since I was born. And generally, I'm speaking to complete strangers. Um, so it's very odd in this online era to be able to give a talk. I'm not locally, I mean, and usually I'm around Victoria, and so it's very odd to uh, be able to talk to so many people, and I can see my parents have been very busy. I see a lot of familiar names here, um, and they've been bu busy inviting people, um, but with that, I will get to my, my content here today, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about microplastics. Some of you may know about microplastics and what they are, and some of you may not, and so I'm hoping I can cover uh, kind of a broad range from some of the basics and then getting into more of the science and what we're doing and, and the cutting edge of this research worldwide. Um, so as David mentioned, I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Biology at UVic here in Victoria. And I am currently in my fifth year and I am going to be ideally graduating in the spring. And um, if things go according to plan, I will hopefully be starting a postdoctoral position at the University of Toronto next year and switching a little bit to thinking about lakes, which will be interesting. Um, but here, I will start with just giving you a quick little outline of everything I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to start by broadly introducing my work and what I do. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about society and plastics. I'm going to introduce microplastics and how they are studied. I'm going to talk about the effects of microplastics on animals, or at least what we know about them, uh, as well as on humans. I'm going to talk a bit about some work I was part of on human exposure to microplastics. And then I'm going to close with hopefully a slightly happier note on what we can do and what we are already doing as a society to try to solve this problem. So David already kind of mentioned this, but my, my work has broadly been about microplastics, but I've um, covered a few different topics within this. So I have my first publication that I published last year with my first PhD chapter, which was related to how we sample microplastics in seawater um, and different methods worldwide and, and what different researchers doing things different ways really means for us. Um, then I, some work that I will discuss today was related to shellfish. So um, uh, clams and oysters in relation to shellfish aquaculture in BC. I published last year with my lab mate Kieran um, on human consumption of microplastics and we got a fair number of press coverage with that, including I think there was like a day where I was just on the CBC syndication route across the country doing a lot of radio interviews. So that one uh, got a lot of attention as you might imagine. And then what I've been currently working on relates more to microplastics in marine food webs. A food web being this complex connect connected network of animals that are feeding on one another. And I'll talk to, to that a little bit, although that work is still kind of in progress. Okay, but let's start with plastic. So we have been using plastic for not actually that long. So really only the last 70 years or so is when we have really, really been using a lot of plastic. And starting around in the 1950s, following the Second World War, 
Um, plastic became a cheap and convenient thing for people to use, but it really didn't until the 1970s, 1980s, it didn't really become a super popular thing. And you can see looking over here that the pl global plastic production uh, trending up here in million tons um, stayed relatively low, but then following 1970, you start getting this big uptick um, with the red being the plastic production that has happened thus far up to 2013, which is when this figure was made and the yellow being the projected plastic production moving forward to 2050. So these numbers are very large um, and kind of meaningless because they're so big. But essentially in 2013, we made around 311 million metric tons of plastic per year. And if we keep this exponential growth, we're looking at around 1.8 billion metric tons of plastic being produced every year. Currently, the most, most plastic production occurs in North America, in Europe, and in Asia, especially in China, um, with a lot of production. And unfortunately, of all this plastic that has been produced, there is a study that came out in 2015 by Geyer et al. in Science Advances, and they looked at, um, they basically did a big global estimate of all the plastic that has been produced since 1950 through 2015, so essentially ever. Um, because that's when the, the majority of plastic has been produced. Um, keeping in mind that uh, plastics are generally produced from fossil fuels, right? So a lot of, a lot of uh, plastics are actually directly linked to oil and gas companies. Um, and so the plastics are made with these petrochemical byproducts. A majority of now you can make them out of plant material, but right now we're primarily making them out of fossil fuels. And so of this 8.3 billion metric tons of plastics that has been produced essentially all of all time, we're still using about 2.5 billion tons of that, um, metric tons of that. And so that could be in things like automobiles, um, aircraft, homes, like things that are construction materials, things that will last for longer periods of time. Um, however, that is only a... Uh, uh, not a not a tiny, but it's a smaller fraction. It's not the majority of plastic, and so most of the plastic that we've ever made has been thrown away, and so it's either been discarded into um, landfills or uh, found its way into the natural environment. It's been incinerated or it's gone into the recycling waste stream. Um, but really, unfortunately, and probably when I started giving these talks, people were often shocked by these numbers. And now they are not because there has been a fair bit of media coverage on this now. But only around 9% of plastics that have ever been made have actually been recycled. And of that 9% that goes into the, the recycling waste stream, only about 0.9% of the total amount, so about 10% of what's getting recycled once, gets recycled more than once. Uh, so that means that pretty much all plastic, even if it's going into the recycling, is eventually gonna pop out of this waste, this recycling stream and end up going into the discard or incineration stream, right? Because each time it goes through the cycle, it's only got a 10% chance of making it through another time around. And with that said, different products are completely different. Things like plastic bottles are highly recyclable. Things like textiles are highly not recyclable. And any sort of other mixed plastics and things like that are very not recyclable. And I'll talk about this a little bit later, but a lot of it really has to do with product design design. Uh, so yeah, unfortunately about 79% of all the plastic ever made is either in landfills or in the natural environment. Now of this plastic production, currently around 50% or over 50% actually of plastic packaging, or sorry, of plastic uh, production is actually just for plastic packaging. So a lot of this is like that single use plastic um, that you would use once and throw away. I think I remember hearing a stat recently that the average use of a piece of plastic is about uh, 20 minutes. So about a third of the plastics used in Canada are single use or these short lived products and packaging. And we're also no better than anywhere else in the world and that we recycle less than 10% of our plastic. Uh, so this really is a global problem. Now, what do I mean when I talk about plastic, right? Uh, some people probably have some idea. They might think of their a plastic drinking bottle or um, I, you may even think of your polyester shirt, but there are not a lot of different plastics and there are a lot of things that are plastic that you might not have even realized are plastic. So looking at the most commonly produced polymers, um, things like polyethylene, polypropylene, and polystyrene are the three most commonly produced uh, type polymers. So that's the name. The polymer is a name for essentially the, the molecule that makes up the base of the, um, 
of the plastic. Um, so polyethylene is used in things like plastic bags and storage containers. Polypropylene will be things like bottle caps, rope gear, um, that hard strapping. It also goes into a lot of like food uh, packaging. Polystyrene will be those, uh, those little white um, single-use utensils, takeaway utensils, uh, styrofoam cups. So there's the expanded, there's expanded polystyrene as well as the regular polystyrene. And you might recognize other things like nylon and polyester and acrylic from clothing. Acrylic also goes into, um, into paint. Um, but there's also a whole lot of other polymers and these often all get combined together into products to make different things. Uh, and so as you'll notice here, actually these common polymers, when you look globally at the microplastics that we turn up in the ocean, um, it tracks with the uh, common, most commonly produced polymers. Okay, so, but what are microplastics? So microplastics are these tiny little plastic particles or fibers that are less than five millimeters in their longest dimension. And so usually when I'm especially talking to younger kids, I'll kind of tell them it's about the size of a grain of rice or the eraser on a pencil. I thought I had, oh, maybe I do, no I don't. Um, maybe the eraser on the end of a pencil, something like this, right? So pretty small, something you can kind of just see maybe as big as your a little bit smaller than your pinky fingernail, and then all the way down to a microscopic level where we'll need a microscope to see it. And they can come from a variety of different materials, as I just mentioned, from different in different shapes, colors, sizes, and in sources, and they really do turn up everywhere in the environment in that we look. Uh, that said, we've really only been looking for around the last 10 to 15 years. So back in 2004, um, Professor Richard Thompson in the University of Plymouth in the UK published pretty much the first paper uh, directly. Well, he, he coined the term microplastics in that paper. And while there had been some work going back to the 70s documenting plastic fragments in the ocean, he was really the one to draw attention to the issue of plastics in the oceans. And so following that, there was a trickle of publications happening back here since 24, um, but even up through around 2011, 2012, there was very few, there were very few publications on microplastics. But then through 2013 going forward, we're now in this exponential increase in microplastics publications, which if you're not so familiar with academia and with scientists, this is kind of our currency. It's how we talk about things, it's by publishing papers. And so this reflects really like how much interest the scientific community has developed in microplastics just in the last 10 years. And currently this number is way up off the charts up here. I do uh, check-ins every Friday where I look at all the new papers that have come out in the last week. And now it's not, it's pretty common for me to be looking at maybe 50 papers a week, maybe more. So we're really publishing a lot right now. Microplastics can be divided up into two categories. The first are primary microplastics. So these are manufactured to be small by industry. So it can include these primary production pellets or uh, so commonly called nurdles. So these are these tiny little feedstock pellets and they basically get melted down by, um, by manufacturers uh, of like secondary manufacturers who are making plastic products. We'll melt them down, put them into molds or blow them out into various different things. And then that's what the final plastic product comes from. Um, but these can get shipped around the world in shipping containers and fall off boats or get washed out of factories and things like that. So they do end up in the marine environment a fair bit. And then there are the microbeads, which are kind of infamous now. And these are the smaller primary production or smaller pellets that can go into, they were going at least in Canada, a lot into cosmetic products and still they are in some parts of the world. Although there are now like a lot of global bans and a lot of countries on these. And so um, back in the day, you could get this toothpaste that would have these little chunks of polyethylene, for example, in it. Um, granted that there are still some that are a little more stealthy. So some cosmetic products can still have some polymers in them. For example, in Canada, sunscreen is not classified as a rinse off cosmetic. And so manufacturers would still be allowed to put tiny little microbeads in it. Um, it's not covered by that ban. Uh, the second category of microplastics are secondary microplastics. And this is by and large what we actually find in the ocean. Those primary microplastics, while concerning, are really only a tiny percentage of what shows up in the ocean. Really what we see are these 
secondary plastics which have degraded from larger plastic items. So if you can see, especially in a more exposed area, I took this picture up on the north end of Vancouver Island where there's a lot of big waves and wind and exposure. And you'll just see this kind of like plastic sand washing up on the beach. So these large things will get hammered against the shore or just the sun will be down and they start to break into smaller pieces. And this is, uh, this is how these secondary fragments get generated. There's also uh, fibers, which are a big source, especially in more um, quieter coastal areas where the one of the biggest sources of microplastics into the ocean are going to be sewage. And so that's things like polyester and nylon, which are these are all pictures I've taken on a microscope in my own samples. And this is what a tiny fiber from your clothing might look like at 100 times magnification. Uh, and for example, a study in Europe found that 130 billion synthetic fibers per cubic meter that would come out of washing machine effluent. So each load of laundry or in a couple of loads, you could be producing millions, if not billions of these microfibers. And so I mentioned sewage, but there's a lot of different ways microplastics can go into the environment. Um, as well as back into, into animals and into humans. They can get dispersed via wind and rain, by ocean currents, rivers. Um, animals can eat them and move them around. They can, yeah, as I mentioned, they can, they can come down through the, the rain or they can get directly dumped or washed out there. And we know also now we're starting to figure out they're also a pretty big issue in freshwater. So that's actually often the direct, more direct source of them, especially for sewage treatment. Commonly, it's going into freshwater and then going to the ocean via um, things like rivers. But they can also get blown through the atmosphere or deposited back from sewage sludge. So after sewage treatment, a lot of the, uh, the settled sludge will get put back onto land, um, often as like a fertilizer in farming. And microplastics can end up back on land that way and then perhaps get blown or washed back out into rivers and oceans again through that mechanism. So it's this complex cycle. Um, and just to highlight, especially, oh, go back a sec. One thing I forgot to mention, another um, kind of emerging source is actually car tires right here. And so when driving your car, uh, you, you'll obviously, you know that you have to change your tires pretty, you know, every couple of years or so. And that's because your tire is essentially degraded away. And people don't always realize, but your tires are commonly made of a synthetic rubber. Um, and so these are classified as microplastics, this tire crumb that comes off your car tires and often it contain, uh, can contain some pretty harmful chemicals. And so those microplastics also are actually a big source of my, um, into coastal environments. Um, but in terms of the textiles, so just washing, for example, this acrylic sweater can produce around 700,000 microfibers per load. Um, washing this, uh, this polyester sweat, sweater in the study released around 500,000. So it's definitely a non-trivial amount. And while sewage treatment can potentially take up to uh, 90 or even 99% out, depending on the level of treatment they're doing, even when you're talking about 90%, if you're talking about still 10, 10 to one to ten percent of something of billions of something going into the environment, that's still a pretty high number, right? So it can't necessarily completely solve the problem. So once microplastics get out into the ocean, they are essentially at the mercy of the currents and the wind and the rain, and uh, they get washed and blown around, but primarily they're really driven by these global circulation currents. So you may have heard of the North Pacific garbage patch, which is right in the middle of the North Pacific gyre here. And what that is, is essentially an accumulation zone where you just get a really high density of plastics accumulating over time. Because as these currents are circulating globally, uh, it creates this dead zone in the center. And somewhat fortunately, it's actually also a relatively low uh, diversity zone for biology so there are less there is kind of less life there because there are less nutrients there's less circulation going on in that area um, however people don't always realize that we actually have a bunch of, of these gyres in other parts of the oceans as well there's a south pacific gyre there's a north atlantic and a south atlantic gyre and that's reflected as you can see by this heat map uh, from low microplastic concentration to high and you can see for example in the antarctic you get low concentrations, but even, um, but yeah, in these gyres, you get these higher concentrations of particles predicted to show up, as well as actually in the Arctic, you get um, surprisingly high concentrations because a lot of these currents and the global circulation actually ends up with seawater getting transported into the Arctic. So even though very few people live through this area in Northern Canada, Northern Russia, 
we still actually do find a fairly high um, microplastic concentrations relative to other parts of the world. And another thing that drives how microplastics move throughout the world has to do with their density. So not all plastics are created equal. I mentioned uh, polyethylene that would be, uh, so low density polyethylene might be something like a plastic grocery bag. High density HDP might be like a, um, a food container or something like a harder plastic. And so while both of these are less dense, so seawater is about 1.0 gram per cubic centimeter. And so anything that's less than that, so here we have like polypropylene and these polyethylenes will float on plastic, whereas anything that is a higher density is going to sink, right? And so, um, so you'll actually see that like these things like PVC um, that's used in like plumbing and things like that uh, is actually going to sink. And so these tiny little microplastic particles, some of them are going to float and get transported around that way, and some of them are going to sink. However, because they're so small, um, some of them will get eaten by an animal if they're lighter and potentially pooped out and sink down that way. They may get fouled by a bunch of organisms growing on them and then sink or if they have already sunk, they might get moved up by an animal or a current might resuspend them. And so this is quite complicated and it's not always determined completely by density and they can really cycle up and down throughout the ocean. And there have been a lot of different animals shown to have ingested microplastics or eaten microplastics. So ranging from tiny little zooplankton, which are the base of uh, most of our marine food webs, all the way up through different weird and wonderful creatures from sea sponges to anemones and worms, um, different lobsters and shellfish and things, um, and different fish, and even our charismatic big megafauna such as, a humpback, as the humpback whale. So there has been a question globally. Often you'll see this. I see this all the time in news stories. I hear it all the time from member people in, in the public just kind of saying, well, you know, like fish are, uh, eating these and um, that it's gonna move up through the food chain and get to us and get to larger fish. So this is, this is widely claimed by um, studies. Sorry, I just realized this slide is from another pre-recorded talk. So please ignore that other um, thing moving around that's from a previous talk. I'm just gonna move mine to the side, so that's distracting. Um, but anyway, so this is widely claimed, but our preliminary evidence actually doesn't really suggest that this is occurring. So if you look at this graph over here, this is from this paper by Welkenshaw all early this year. And as you go up through different trophic levels, which is essentially that level in a food web that an animal is feeding at, so going from like a mussel all the way up to a big tuna, um, they actually found a decrease going up in terms of microplastics, in terms of the, um, the grams per wet weight of the stomach tissues. And so it actually suggests that animals are pretty good at pooping out microplastics, and so they at least for these larger ones, I'm gonna talk about size a little bit later, but for the ones that were commonly studied, it doesn't actually seem that they're magnifying as you go up through the food web, um, but maybe the smaller animals feeding at the bottom might be a greater risk. And I'll talk more about how what that means for humans a little bit later as well. And some of my own work lately is backing up this idea as well. Another interesting thing about microplastics is that there's this whole term called the plastosphere that people have started talking about. So this is the surface of a piece of plastic, uh, super zoomed in on a scanning electron microscope, and you'll see these tiny little microbial cells that are growing on it. So there's a whole unique community of organisms that actually live on plastic, uh, little microbes that prefer to live on it. Some of them could actually be harmful. So people have found higher levels of like harmful algae or um, back, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria showing up on plastics. So there has been some call for trying to figure this out. Is this another way in which plastics could potentially cause harm? Um, also weird and interesting things is like some of this algae that likes to grow on plastic can actually produce a smell, um, dimethyl sulfone, which can smell good to some animals, for example, seabirds. So some seabirds might actually seek out little chunks of plastic and pre preferably eat them because they smell like their usual food. Okay, so how do we actually study these tiny little plastic particles? Well, it's pretty challenging. I can definitely tell you that. Um, so for example, if you're thinking, if I'm looking at a fish, I need to find a way to get rid of that fish, but keep the tiny little bits of plastic that are in the fish's stomach or whatever tissue I'm interested in, right? So you're gonna start with this complex sample, whether it's uh, some kind of animal or seawater or sediment, and it's gonna be all chunky and it's gonna have stuff in it and I need to 
purify it and get down to just what could be plastic. So the first step commonly is some kind of digestion. So people have used uh, acids or bases or enzymes. Um, generally in the field, we tend to use strong bases. What I use often is potassium hydroxide, which is a really strong base. And that's gonna digest away the biological tissue while leaving behind any plastic. We're gonna do some separation and concentration. So I'm gonna, I commonly use sodium iodide, which is a really dense salt. And so I can make up this salt solution and plastics will float to the surface. Well, things like sand are gonna float down or sink to the bottom and then I can purify it that way. And then it's gonna get concentrated onto some kind of filter. So I'll, I'll filter it through a really tiny, tiny filter using a vacuum. Um, and then from there, then we have to actually determine what could be microplastics. So there's some imaging and counting on a microscope that I tend to do. But now we also, we also need to chemically check those particles, right? Because even though something might look like it could be plastic, maybe it's brightly colored, um, it could be a non-plastic material. So we need to identify it via some kind of analytical technique. Um, things like most commonly used are things like FTIR, which is Fourier, Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy as well. And these are essentially using um, uh, in the case of FTIR, infrared light, or in the case of Raman, um, using a, a laser to um, excite the particle and then to put it through a computer. You can put, um, look at a, uh, it's called like a spectrograph, and you can basically compare it with a library and then try to figure out uh, what that material is and if it's plastic. And so as I mentioned, um, in my lab, what this looks like, well, this is a sea cucumber here, and so I've digested out sorry, dissected out its digestive tract, so that's its stomach and intestines. And then that's gonna get turned into this brown sludge using my uh, potassium hydroxide. And then filtered on, these, these are, um, this is a filter set, filtration assembly, and also I have these tiny filters you can see in there, and it's gonna get sucked through that. But we have to be really careful, right? Because as I mentioned earlier, plastics and microplastics, and especially these little fibers, can blow through the air and really end up all over the place. So we have to be really careful with our samples because when we're looking at them, we want to be sure that what we're measuring is coming in with the sample and isn't just uh, coming in from our lab or something, right? Or I brought it in because I uh, maybe I had some polyester in my clothing or something. So what things we'll do is control airflow in the lab, um, cover up our clothing. So we wear these, I like to call them banana suits, but they're these bright yellow Tyvek suits. Uh, we tend to fight plastic with plastic, unfortunately, because what's a cheap, low shedding material that we can easily cover things with? Well, things like plastic garbage bags work pretty well, actually. So unfortunately, we often have to do that. But these um, yellow Tyvek suits we wear over our clothes, we work in this thing, which is a laminar flow hood. It's gonna blow air into our faces and keep this space positively pressurized so that particles aren't, can't go in and settle there. And then we also run controls. So essentially running blank samples alongside samples to check for any background contamination and account for it. And, uh, and then I work on like a, on a microscope and I keep it covered up with a garbage bag to try to keep any particles from settling in there. And so what I'll do is go through, or me or like a lab technician will go through and pick out these tiny particles and say, um, based on characteristics, looking at it, say, is this something that could be a microplastic? If it, and based on, for example, for fibers, there's some different criteria we might use. And if it is potentially a microplastic, We'll pick it out and put it onto these. Um, these are actually uh, transparencies, like those overhead projector transparencies, which we've cut into circles and then put into a petri dish. And so then each particle is going to get picked out with tiny tweezers and put onto that um, into that petri dish and labeled. So each of these, you can't even see it because they're all microscopic, but each of these circles contains a little potentially plastic particle. And then so at least for my current work, what we used then was a Raman spectrometer, which is this machine here. And I went and did this work last year at the University of Toronto in Ontario. And this thing shoots a laser down at your particle and then I'm gonna get a readout on the computer that'll tell me potentially what kind of um, particle it is. Okay, so that's how we study these. Um, but what do we know about the effects of microplastics on animals and humans? Well, this complex figure is one of my favorites, and it comes from Chelsea Rockman at University of Toronto. And I like it because it really displays how complicated this is. So when we say microplastics, 
one microplastic is not the same as another. And so in their paper, they started with the line, microplastics are not microplastics are not microplastics. And it really rings true because we can have all these different polymers I mentioned. We can have chemical additives in with plastics. There are like thousands, literally thousands of different chemical additives that are used in the manufacture of plastics. Some of those can have toxic effects in and of themselves, which we need to separate from the plastics to figure out toxicity. Um, there are product types that can be different blends of these polymers and have different additives as well in with themselves. And then there can be a range of size. So these part particles aren't all created equally, right? Or maybe they start larger and they get smaller and smaller. So anything from like that five millimeters I mentioned all the way down into the micro and nano realm. So this is the really, really tiny stuff that is very hard to study. They can come also in a lot of different shapes. So we can have chunkier, uh, jagged fragments or perfect spheres. Um, we can have films, so like from a plastic grocery bag, you'd imagine a really thin plastic film. Um, and then fibers, they can come in a lot of different uh, colors, which might determine what animal might go and eat it based on the color. And then they can also take in other uh, ecotoxins, for example, um, different persistent chemicals. So DDT is a type of pesticide that is, has been banned um, for a while, but is persistent in the environment. Um, things like PCBs and, uh, and PAHs, which are polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are combustion products. So these things can tend to also accumulate on the plastics. Although I should say that this part of the equation, the ecotoxins, has been of concern to researchers for quite a while, but it's getting very clear now based on modeling um, that generally these um, persistent chemicals are already in the environment so much that any ingestion of like microplastics by animals or by humans probably isn't changing the overall dosage. So we probably can cross this part off the list and worry a lot less about it and focus more on the additives and then what the plastic polymers and particles themselves might be doing in terms of health. And so what they could be doing is there are some physical outcomes. So if you had enough plastics in an animal, maybe their digestive tract could get blocked or abraded. Um, there's pseudo satiation, which is essentially like false fullness. So if an animal were eating enough plastic, it might feel full, but actually not be. Um, these are also problems more for high concentrations of microplastics, which we don't actually tend to find in the environment. So also, again, these are hard to know um, if these are really something we should worry about. Something that's emerging more is across the board, things like oxidative stress and inflammation, which is essentially, is a very complicated medical thing I don't fully understand myself, but you can kind of think of it as uh, just making something sick in the long term. And so this local inflammation tends to be a pretty common uh, across the board result of plastics and microplastics. And this could be especially an issue for these smaller micro and nano things where they could potentially get into the circulatory system and other parts of the body and over time perhaps cause inflammation and illness that way. Um, there are also the chemicals, so the, the chemical components of the plastic might be leaching, and then these other additives, um, flame retardants, there's a lot of especially flame retardants and fat phthalates, um, which are used as like a plasticizer to make plastic more malleable, and um, other things you might have heard of like BPA, which is a known endocrine disruptor that a lot of manufacturers have stopped putting into plastic, although to be honest, what they replaced it with, I believe, is just as toxic. Um, yes, and so yeah, so this is kind of broadly, this is the really complicated area and I don't wanna to spend too much time on it because it is, it hurts your brain and it's really complicated. Um, it's not so simple as plastics makes you sick. It's really complicated and we don't know completely. Laboratory studies, um, people tend to use really high concentrations and it's hard to relate those to what shows up in the environment. So this is an area where all researchers are, we are still all very much scratching our heads on it. We have conferences and debates about this stuff all the time. Some people think that plastics are killing everything. Some people uh, think that, well, maybe they're not doing anything yet, but everyone agrees that Pretty much um, by the end of the century, if we don't change our habits, we're going to be producing enough plastics to create enough microplastics in the environment that we're definitely going to see start some of these things being an issue. So it's uh, no matter what, we need to get ahead of this now. This is another complicated figure, but basically just kind of showing that it can, you can, you can uh, as a human or an animal, you can inhale these things, you can ingest them, maybe they can go in your body, but then these things can act across a number of different scales. So it also you kind of also have to think, what do we really care about and, and what is happening here, right? So we can have things that happen on the level of a cell or an organ or on the individual, but they can scale up for animals to affect their population. So even if you have minor effects 
on a cell. In the long term, this could potentially cause population or ecosystem level effects and by affecting um, species interactions and things like that. This is more complicated things too, and this is hopefully actually what I'll be studying more um, with my postdoc next year is these population ecosystem level effects. Um, okay, and so especially as I mentioned, this translocation thing going into body tissues is something that is starting to emerge and we're doing research on this paper back from 2017, found these little chunks of microplastics within the livers of, um, I believe these are anchovy livers, these cross sections. And so these chunks here are all little bits of plastic they were able to find there. And so there is this question now of um, what is that doing? And that is kind of an emerging area of research as well. And so that's where the size really comes in because we have this thing that is basically a methodological gap. So all those techniques I talked about earlier for studying microplastics really only apply when you go over um, mostly likely about 100 microns, so like a tenth of a millimeter, and then they really break down below one micron, so that's a thousandth of a millimeter. And down here in the nano realm, we just really have no idea what we're doing, and they're really hard to measure in the environment. So we don't know how exposed uh, we or animals are and our lab exposure while we can do them We don't know if they're realistic because we can't really measure this stuff that is potentially getting into our bodies the most We can't really measure it in the environment yet Okay, but what about human exposures as I've talked about a little bit? Um, well, I can tell you in terms of shellfish in British Columbia um, from my I did this study over the first three years of my um, PhD and we went out and we looked uh, at different shellfish, so these vanilla clams and Pacific oysters, um, which are the two most commonly cultured shellfish species in British Columbia. And we cultured them both on and off shellfish farms and left them for a summer, so for around three months, and then saw how many microplastics they had in the different sites afterwards. And we found overall less than one microplastic particle per shellfish, so pretty low numbers. And the source primarily, primarily seemed to be textile fibers, um, suggesting really the risk to consumers of shellfish in BC are pretty low and minimal. And that um, if we wanted to reduce this, it's probably just better to think on a larger scale and cut back on plastics and everything, and especially with the sewage and textiles stuff. So kind of the same answer we get to um, that other people get in other parts of the world as well. And broadly, it always a lot of it comes back in these coastal areas to uh, our sewage. This other work that I worked on last year with my lab mate Kieran, um, and we, uh, oh sorry, no, that, I'm doing that after. This is, uh, this is relating um, microplastics and shellfish. So there's an, if I looked at that study from Canadian shellfish, from BC shellfish, and I look at average consumption, you can estimate maybe 87 microplastic particles per person per year for people eating BC shellfish. Um, a study from the UK did something similar and found about 123 particles per person per year, per year in the UK. So that's pretty similar results to what I found, which is always nice. Um, when they upped their estimates in terms of countries where people eat more shellfish, you could see maybe up to like four or 5,000 microplastics per person per year. Um, however, when they literally put out some uh, filters to mimic what a dinner plate would be doing during a meal, they were estimated that a person uh, an average person in the UK would be exposed to about 13 to 68,000 uh, fibers just from their food sitting out on a dinner plate while they're eating it. So really, in terms of things like shellfish, we're probably just by being in our homes, which are full of plastic and have, we have plastic carpets, we have plastic clothes, we have plastic everything. And so the microplastics just floating in around in our air are probably going to contaminate our food way more than what's coming in from the environment, at least for a shellfish. Um, and so I mentioned some of these, but there are a lot of different ways they could end up in our food. The animal could take it up during its lifetime, although for seafood, I suspect this is pretty low relative to some of the other sources. Um, it can settle on, your, uh, settle on your food, as I mentioned. It could get contaminated during transport and sale. So especially like plastic packaging, we're starting to find out, especially if you're heating it, can produce a lot of especially tiny, tiny microplastics and go into food. So I suspect, there's not good data on this yet, but I suspect that we're going to start seeing that there's a lot of microplastics in highly packaged food. Um, there could also be contamination during other things like processing. And so we wanted to find out last year, or a couple of years ago, um, a few of us in my lab wanted to figure out whether, um, to what extent humans might be exposed based on what we know. And so we published this paper last year called Human Consumption of Microplastics. 
And what we did is we found 26 studies that looked at different um, food, drinking water, and air, um, things humans were exposed to. We look at microplastic concentrations within them, and then we looked at those characteristics. We were able to get 402 data points, over 3,600 samples across these studies. We looked at uh, recommended intake, uh, dietary intake for Americans. There's just really good data on this available in the US, which is why we use it from the Department of Agriculture and um, other sources. And we separated out by sex and age. And we basically just soaked the microplastic concentration in each of these different food groups, multiplied it by their recommended consumption, and then did a rough estimate based on that of microplastic consumption for an average American. And so what we found, um, you can see a, these plots here represent the average with a, a um, kind of like a confidence interval around it for male and female um, children and adults at the top and the bottom here. And so what you can see is there's a lot of uncertainty, but on average, really what we see is things like seafood, while they do tend to come out a bit higher than some of these other things, it's because when you look at this, things like honey and salt um, are, and sugar, are we're definitely consuming in, in likely less quantities than the seafood, which is probably why it's higher. But we're also missing a lot of data on things like red meat, poultry, dairy, grains, fruits, and vegetables. And so there's a lot of gaps in here in terms of human exposure. But when we do tally up the, the food and drinking water, we get to about 39 to 52,000 um, microplastic particles per year. Um, and when we combine that with inhalation, so as you can see, the highest route based on what we know is gonna be from just inhaling. And that accounts for about, um, when you add those together, you get about 74 to 122,000 particles per year. And so we were only able to account for about 15% of recommended caloric intake in the US. Um, as I mentioned, we're missing a bunch of data. Um, in similar results, actually, there was a study in Austria and they looked at human poo. And they, um, based on that, um, another researcher estimated, based on what they found in eight different individuals, that perhaps those people were consuming around 29,000 um, to 1 million particles or 1.5 million particles per person per year. And so that actually kind of fits in with our range of estimates and that upper end could represent the missing bit that we weren't able to account for. Um, but as I mentioned before, while we might be starting to get an idea of exposure for humans, we don't have an idea of what those numbers mean, right? Does it take a billion particles? Does it take a million? Um, at what point are there health effects for humans? We just don't really understand that yet. Um, commonly in these food groups, um, the most common things that, research, that researchers found were fibers as well, matching with that kind of idea of textiles. Um, although, keep in mind that this is for larger particles because we struggle to measure those really small ones. And when you go smaller, they're mostly all going to be little fragments that have broken down from larger things. So I always kind of say, well, should you be worried about this? And I think the answer, unfortunately, as with a lot of things, is that Maybe, and it's complicated. Um, there's no real smoking gun yet. There's no, oh, microplastics are causing cancer. Um, as I mentioned, while we have some idea of hazard, which is basically the potential for something to cause harm, we're starting to get some data on exposure, but these are still very gray areas and we don't fully know. And our actual risk to health is a multiplication of these two things. And so we can't do a really good risk estimate until we have really good um, data on these things. And the estimated doses we're seeing are actually pretty low relative to exposure to other particle types. So for things like, um, for example, like titanium dioxide, which is a common food additive and goes into lots of other things, um, we're exposed to billions of those particles. And um, that level may not have time. Bodies can handle really high uh, doses of tiny little particles of other types of things. It's just whether or not well, do these plastics, are they extra toxic compared to other things? And so that's ongoing research. Um, and if they are negative impacts, they're probably gonna be more in the long term. And so I kind of like to say, well, based on what we know now, if you're uh, smoking a pack a day of cigarettes, you're probably at a way bigger health risk, but this is something you know we need to do more research on. But we can always take precautionary steps and reduce our plastic. And especially for the environment, we know that the big plastics are having an impact, right? We know that um, we know that seabirds are eating these big plastics and dying. We know that whales are getting entangled in fishing gear. We know uh, we know that plastics having an impact on the environment, even if we're still figuring out what the microplastics are doing. And so we do still need to really uh, 
go according to the precautionary principle and start trying to reduce our release of plastics and microplastics to the environment now. And as I mentioned, most researchers, researchers will agree that even if they're not causing harm now, microplastics are definitely gonna be high enough in the environment to cause harm um, by the end of the century. So the best things we can do, um, and I'm sure a lot of you do these things already, these are pretty basic things, but avoiding any single-use plastic. As I mentioned, single-use plastic is about, and pa plastic packaging is around, is over half of global plastic production, right? So that's really the low-hanging fruit, um, and that's why things like the Canadian government ban on single-use plastic make a lot of sense is because this is a big market and so cutting back on this stuff is going to majorly cut down on our plastic use um, especially for things that may not be super necessary like um, plastic water bottles when you can easily bring your own um, or reuse even and um, plastic bags for, for which we have alternatives and we can reuse bags and um, and and help the environment that way and um, as I mentioned, there's some lesser known culprits, things like car tires, which don't have an easy solution, although there was a cool prize in Europe given out a few weeks ago or a month or two ago. And they actually, these researchers um, came up with a design of a thing that could uh, clip onto like a car and actually through, um, I think it's like electrostatic forces could basically collect a lot of this, like half of the tire dust coming off a tire during its lifetime. So there are some cool technological solutions that could help with some of these things. There are tons of things people don't even think about. So I always like to tell people, well, just read labels and figure out if things are plastic and if they are and if they're gonna be going in the environment. So especially something like glitter, you're gonna throw it around, it's gonna go everywhere. A lot of the glitter is just tiny, is literally microplastics and tiny little bits of plastic. So there are natural alternatives to that. You can get natural glitter that's not um, made of plastic. And then with like our textiles, being aware of what our clothes are made of, um, not washing them more than we need to, um, generally less is more in terms of um, uh, uh, preventing the release of uh, textiles to the environment. And then also there are like washing machine filters you can get, um, for example, that really help reduce the release of these textiles to the environment. Um, then there is this kind of like emerging issue of biodegradable plastics. So with people knowing more and more about plastics and being concerned about them, um, companies are starting to try to get ahead here and release these um, bio or biodegradable plastics. So there's some confusion here because there's a lot of different terms that get thrown around. Um, so bioplastic is one term that you might see and that all that means, the bio part just means that it's been made from a plant. So you can make polyethylene either from fossil fuels or from corn or some other type of, uh, of um, plant material. And so just because it's a bioplastic doesn't necessarily mean it's better for the environment in the long run because it still can be the same type of plastic. So these ones are definitely on the avoid list. Um, biodegradable ones can be problematic because it may not actually mean compostable and it may not actually even mean biodegradable. So for example, there's ones called oxo biodegradable plastics and commonly these literally just have little things that break apart within them and then they actually just produce microplastics rather than actually completely going away. They're just gonna like fracture into tiny microplastics. So again, this term gets kind of misused and probably should avoid. Compostable plastics are maybe sometimes okay um, but when a plastic is compostable, you'll probably, you might see this BPI label, for example, in Victoria, to compost any plastic, it has to have this BPI label on it. And um, they only decompose in industrial composting facilities. If it goes in the ocean, it's going to act just like any other plastic. And in fact, research is starting to show that things like polylactic acid, which is a really common biodegradable um, or a common compostable plastic that is used, like those, uh, those um, you'll often, you, you may have seen those like compostable beer cups and things like that, and they might get labeled compostable, uh, and they might say PLA on the bottom, and that actually is coming out to be uh, with organism exposure. It looks like it's just as toxic, if not more toxic, than a lot of other um, types of plastic, so that's not always a good solution either. And while some composting facilities do take these things, um, there was a recent quote in the Globe and Mail in the last couple of years, I pulled this quote, and at that point they were writing um, of the 200 industrial composting facilities in Canada, only about 40 were accepting compostable bags for processing. So a lot of times people are putting this stuff in and then it's just going to a composting facility 
um, and then it's just getting strained out and put into a landfill. And so if that's happening, you're better off using conventional plastic because then at least that has a chance of getting recycled. Whereas if you're putting a compostable plastic in that's not even composting, that's just going to the landfill um, for sure. So in general, I think those also come under the sort of avoiding all plastics is be probably the best thing uh, in terms of the single use things. Um, and then, yeah, I like to read my clothing labels. I'm obsessive about it now. And so I try to, I mean, I try to buy a lot of secondhand clothes because in general, if you're buying new, it's not always necessarily better to go to like wool or cotton. Those also have really large environmental impacts. Uh, so often the best thing you can do is like buy used natural fibers. Um, and then if you do have these synthetic clothes, which is fine, I mean, I have some, um, but really trying to not wash them more than you need to. And uh, even things like using cold water or liquid detergent can actually release less microfibers. Um, I've also heard that front end loader machines produce less microfibers. Um, there are alternatives coming out. For example, rayon and tensile are both semi-synthetic, so it's made out of modified cellulose. So you can make, rayon is commonly, I think, made out of bamboo, and it may biodegrade. We still find in the ocean a lot. Even things like cotton and wool can actually take quite a long time to um, biodegrade in the ocean. Um, and there's other things like tensile, which is maybe more um, eco-friendly, but um, yeah, again, it's, it's, yeah, it's sometimes hard with the trade-offs. But for example, rayon can also be really problematic because it's often made in developing countries using really, really harsh chemicals, and um, there's often not good environmental or employee safety regulations in place in these plants. So a lot of like big companies making rayon are, are causing a lot of harm from that way too. So not plastic is not always better in this regard. Um, and then my favorite thing is beach cleanups are a really great way to get out there, see the plastic on beaches, talk to people about it, and get that plastic out of the ocean. Any plastic you take off a beach is going to be uh, less plastic that can find its way back into the ocean. I took this picture is from the north end of Vancouver Island back in 2015 when I took part in a beach cleanup with living oceans. And this is just a tiny, tiny little bit of some of those plastic debris we were pulling out of there. Um, and then in closing, though, uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of emphasis often with this stuff put on individual responsibility, consumer responsibility. But we really need to remember that this is a global problem, and we really need government regulation. We need industry uh, to take action, but we also need regulation. So this is a really cool. Um, there's two papers that came out in the Journal of Science. For those not familiar, um, this is one of the top journals that exists. And so these were really um, important publications. And I just have two quotes from them here that I thought summed them up pretty good. But um, the big takeaway here from this one paper, this is actually a colleague of mine, Stephanie Burrell, and she was working in the Rockman lab while I was there. But um, basically what they looked at was plastic emissions into the ocean through time, um, basically by running a bunch of different scenarios. So if we do business as usual, if we keep producing uh, our projected amount of plastic and we don't change much, we're going to be emitting, you know, right now we're emitting around, I'd say, I think, um, do, 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 uh, does it have that number? yeah, so we have about 19 to 23 million metric tons of plastic going into the ocean right now. And if we keep business as usual, we're going to be looking at upwards of like 60, right? So we're looking at a high, a big increase um, of business as usual if we go through business as usual. But even if we take the most ambitious, so they were like, if you had millions of people globally cleaning up beaches, if you had all more recycling, if you had all these things, we're still going to see more than 30 million metric tons of plastic going to the ocean per year, which just really, I think, emphasizes like how big of an issue it is. There's just more and more people using more and more things and the plastic production is really increasing. And so this is like this sort of ideal scenario where we can get back to um, like 20, uh, early 20, 2010s and before levels. And that would really take drastic, um, drastic societal changes to get there. And it seems pretty unlikely right now. So it's a really big problem. Um, but it really requires a mix. Um, it's not just your responsibility and it's not just society's responsibility. It's a mix. So at the individual level, we can really increase our awareness. We can take those individual actions to reduce our plastic footprint. Every little bit helps. And the big thing we can do is vote with our dollars. So there's already tons of companies, you know, um, trying to use less plastics or get away or, or make their plastics more recyclable. I like this quote. Um, well, it's not a quote, but 
I saw a talk from Richard Thompson, the researcher at University of Plymouth a couple weeks ago, and I really liked what he said, which was that plastics aren't the problem. It's how, it's, the, it's really a design problem. So plastics have, we just haven't thought about end of life for plastics. We've designed them to be throw away and to not be that recyclable. But really we can change things if industry starts designing plastics to be highly recyclable. Um, to be reusable, then we can um, solve a lot of these issues. And it really is going to take a shift in our norms in society. It's going to take government regulation across jurisdictions, as things like the plastic, single use plastic bans. And we're also going to need standards for compostable waste to avoid all this consumer confusion. I feel confused all the time just trying to figure out can I use this compostable plastic and what do I do with it? Um, right. And so it's just really confusing for the per people right now. And we need these like industry standards and so that um, people know what to do. And then the easy to phase out ones like the single use plastics we can start doing. And then we need to, you know, when you think of something like, for example, fossil fuels, uh, booming industry, and a lot of that is because it's been so heavily subsidized by governments, right? And so imagine if we were putting all these resources into uh, recycling and better plastics technology and, and um, other uh, technologies, right? If we incentivize these things, and so think places like British Columbia are starting to do this through um, extended producer responsibility program so essentially making it um, more expensive to pollute right so um, incentivizing industry to say you need to pay for the recycling of your product goes a long way because now they're going to design their product to be easily recycled right because um, they're going to save money so that's one way we can uh, work towards solving this issue and really what we want to get to ideally is this idea of a circular economy. We've been operating under this idea of a linear economy for um, a long time, basically since the industrial revolution. But before that, we were operating at a circular economy, right? People use natural products and then they, uh, they threw them in the, maybe they just threw them in the environment, but they decompose and, and go back, right? So the earth is kind of this natural circular system, but it's really since we've started using all these synthetic things that, don't biodegrade, we've gotten into this kind of linear system. And so we need to get back into considering resources as um, lasting throughout the economy and not just like a one-time use throwaway uh, kind of economy. And that's really gonna make for a um, better and more sustainable future. And I've talked for a long time now. So <laughs> with that, I will stop and take any questions. I'm gonna pull up the chat, oops. Um, let's see if I can get the chat here. Hey Garth, I can read it out for you. Um, sure. Yeah, I can. I can get the. Okay, so here it is. Yeah, I just pulled up the chat here. All right. Well, you can go through them then. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Oh, cool. So I did go over by a few minutes. I just saw that that uh, message. Okay, so, oh yeah, experts are recommending a polypropylene layer and a COVID cloth mask. Can particles from this be inhaled? That's an inc interesting question, actually. Um, I actually recently cut up a shopping bag um, for the, um, to make a layer for my masks as well. Um, it's hard to say. I mean, I don't know if you would necessarily be inhaling more particles so i think part of the reason for them recommending it is that it is actually it's not a it's a non-woven so it's actually just like a single piece of polypropylene so i don't imagine with like the textiles one of the reasons it sheds so much is because it's like a complex um woven fiber um fibrous material and so like a polypropylene like a non-woven polypropylene i don't imagine is going to be shedding a ton so i would guess that it's probably not you're probably not going to be inhaling like a bunch of fibers or anything. In general, I think probably the COVID um, safety benefits are, I think, greater than the risk of that. Um, but yeah, again, I'm not entirely sure. And then I have a question from David about filters for microplastics. And oh, yeah, and I kind of answered it, but I can also link to. Um, well, I mean, I could, I maybe I'll send these to the, the folks that get put on the website or something, but there are some good materials. So there are like, there's ones you can get that you put your clothes in. There's one called the Guppy Friend or um, that you put synthetic clothes into when you wash them. Um, and then there's one called the Cora Ball that goes into the wash with your clothes and catches fibrins. Um, but both of those are only around 30% effective from studies have shown. 
the best thing you can do is put a filter like onto the the water going out of your washing machine. There's one called the Lint Love R. It's like Lint dash Love L U V dash the letter R. And that one is like 90% effective. And so that's the best thing you can do. And you basically just buy it once and then you just have to clean it into clean it out in your trash every like month or something. Um, I think it's gonna be like 150, 200 bucks, but it's like you basically buy it once and you have it um, for life on your washing machine. So that's really the best thing you can do. Uh, and a question from Graham about, is there any way to get microplastics out of the ocean? <laughs> um, I would say no. I mean, we could, but you'd have to filter out the whole ocean and I don't see that as a feasible solution. There's also a lot of animals living in the ocean that wouldn't like to get filtered. Um, probably the best thing we can do is keep it from going into the ocean. So that can be in the sewage treatment level or like filters on our washing machines. Um, but yeah, there's technologies I think that'll emerge, especially for sewage treatment. Um, and then I have a question from Elizabeth Neal about legal requirements for identifying microbeads in packaging. Um, hmm. I'm sure there are, but I don't really know them. Um, I don't, I, and I struggle with that. I find it confusing too, because there are different polymers that go into materials. And I don't always know whether they're technically classified as like a microbead, as a plastic or not. Um, there's so many different types of polymers. It can be really confusing. So I think that would be something I'm sure there's like chemists and industry experts who know these things. And I don't, unfortunately. Oh yeah, I've got a good question from Dave Biggs on the paper versus plastic debate. I always think that that's like a bit of a misdirection. So that has actually been used, like for example, in Victoria, um, when we first had our plastic bag ban, the, um, the plastics bag industry group, which turns out there is one, um, fought back against it and actually won because they were able to show that it was outside of the jurisdiction of Victoria um, to have that ban. Although ultimately the BC government weighed in and like, um, now we're allowed to do it again, but um, so they basically had the argument, oh, well, pl um, paper has a higher carbon footprint, which is completely true. It takes a lot more energy to make a paper bag, um, and uh, I think it's like something like at least two times as much. So basically, yeah, like if you're going to the grocery store and just completely swapping paper for plastic, it's going to have a big impact on the environment. There's going to be a higher carbon footprint. But I think often what get, gets missed in that conversation is that that's where the the charge comes in. So there's there's a lot of, um, there's evidence showing that when you put even just a 10 cent charge on a bag, that people use them a lot less. So really the reusable bag is the best thing, right? It's not paper first plastic, it's hopefully it's neither. And then if you forget your bag, if you really need to get a bag, then you're gonna get paper. But overall, we need to like be using less bags across the board and then so that way we're gonna get the best of both worlds. Um, I've got a question from Mick on plastics made of algae. Is this a viable solution? Could a plant or algae based plastics replace synthetic in the long run? Um, yeah, that's another interesting question. I think it would depend on the plastics. So like I said, not all plastic is going to be created equally. So um, like you could make a traditional plastic, but maybe we'll get some new materials. Like there's one called poly PHA, forget what it stands for, but it's made by bacteria. And it's kind of a somewhat revolutionary new plastic that is completely biodegradable and seems to be pretty safe. So um, maybe there'll be some solutions there, but I'm not sure yet. <laughs> uh, question on dog plastic doggy poop bags. I always think about this one. I generally think it's a bad idea. Like I've thought about this and I think it's kind of hilarious actually and sort of the sort of comedy of the human species that we take our biodegradable dog poo and then put it in like a non-biodegradable thing and then put it into a landfill to be preserved for like all time. I just kind of think that's funny. Um, so like I think I don't even know what the solution is. I think it's a I have heard of like municipalities having like in parks and stuff having like dog poo only ones and maybe they could like put them in a waste for energy or compost them or something. Um, I know you can get, I think you can get like the biodegradable bags that maybe um, could biodegrade, but again, I just don't know if there's a good answer to this other than like uh, scooping it up and flushing it down the toilet or something. 
that's probably more a question for like a city um it's this is a good that's a good thing to like have a conversation with your like local city councilors or your mayor about um because that's going to be really local uh question on has anyone developed an effective way to get styrofoam off the beach oh like graham what do you mean by styrofoam like big chunks of styrofoam feel free to chip in is graham still there i think he means like all the little bits that break up in the sand and stuff oh yeah 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 um, I have heard of some ones, like there was some researchers at a University of Hawaii, I know, that were working on one of their people, like came up with this wheelbarrow system thing where they like just put a bunch of sand into like a wheelbarrow and turn it around. I forget. Oh my gosh. But anyway, there are like people who have these systems for like separating out microplastics from sand, but it's again, I think it's a lot of like effort to try to get the tiny stuff out and I'm not sure if it's necessarily worth it like definitely getting the larger stuff but going around in tweezers and like trying to pick microplastics out of the sand I don't um, know if that is worth it <laughs> oh sweet and we've got yeah the filtrol is another yeah another washing machine one so the filtrol and the lint lever I think are the most common ones and then there's a question from Emily Cook on regulating microplastics and cosmetic products. And I don't know, I haven't heard of that question that coming up in Canada, although people could be talking about it. Um, but again, I'm not a complete policy expert and, I, and especially being isolated working on my PhD for the last while, I, I'm not completely up to date on what's happening in that world. Ooh. Oh, that's a good question. I have a good question for Michael, Michelle, sorry, Michelle McDonald on um, the new Victoria waste water treatment plant. Yeah, so our waste traditionally just actually just went directly into the Georgia Strait. Um, and apparently, I actually didn't even know that, that they were considering microplastic handling in the design and what impact they'd have in the local ocean environment. That's a really great question. I'd actually thought about that. I'd thought one of my like harebrained side project ideas was just to try to like do some sampling before and after sampling and then I have too many things already on the go but I have talked to people about I'm sort of hoping that someone out there is maybe doing that but that is a really great question and I don't think I have the answer but if they do have even if they have even if it was a secondary treatment secondary or tertiary treatment plan I think it might be a might be a tertiary one then it could potentially be taking like 90 percent of the microplastics out of the um, sewage so i'd say either way having the treatment plant versus not having it is definitely going to reduce the release to the environment got a question from mary on the benefit of reducing microplastic transport to the ocean versus to land-based ecosystems for example we take the microplastic lint from our washing machine and transfer it to the landfill how do we determine that the contaminated rainwater runoff is doing less damage than just letting it reach the ocean maybe more of an ethics question um cool so and that's from mary sun keenan that is a really cool question um so it depends i think it that one is it it depends because somewhere for example like victoria where i live i know like our landfill system is really good so that landfill stuff is going to get compressed down there's going to be some like energy capture from um from that and then it's really it is going to really get buried indefinitely as opposed to like for example and maybe in a, another country, they might have like an open landfill, which we don't have here so much. And so in an open landfill, you're gonna have a way more bigger, like a way bigger issue with the runoff. Um, and so in that case, then that's gonna be a major issue. So it, yeah, in, and in that case, it's probably the broader waste management that is the main issue anyway. So that's probably where you'd wanna um, direct, direct your energies. So I think, yeah, it is totally an ethical question, and I think it is kind of a regionally dependent sort of thing. So, Karen, this is this is David. I think we should probably give you a break. You've been going uh, full tilt for um, over an hour, and uh, I really appreciate it. Everybody does uh, super informative, really well organized, and uh, you're you're always very clear about what you do know and don't know, which is really great. Um, so 
Yeah, so just many, many thanks. And um, there's some follow up from, um, I think Victoria, the one to just, and, and Graham to just present a few things about some of the other talks that are coming uh, to the Marine Education Center. Sweet, thank you everyone. I wish I could have seen you during that whole thing. It's kind of weird answering questions into the void, but I'm, in my head, I'm imagining that I'm talking to you. <laughs> thank you so much. That was so wonderful, Garth. We really appreciate it. Um, before we uh, wrap things up, um, us folks at the Nicholas Sontang Marine Education Center, uh, we just want to call you all in. Um, we have a great call to action here for us um, just to finish off our night and make you feel a little more empowered to do something in your own community. So um, we are going to be doing uh, a citizen scientist program alongside our speaker series, including uh, this talk here today. And um, basically the first one's gonna be kind of solo or in your own household bubble COVID safe beach cleanups, uh, where you can come down to the center, uh, grab a bucket, and um, head down to a beach that you care about uh, near your home or in an area you go to often and pick up some debris and um, document what you find. And uh, this citizen scientist program is to help us here at the Marine Education Center better understand what, um, what uh, types of debris uh, we're finding out here near our own oceans, near the house sound, as well as allow you to get outside uh, and take part in something bigger during these very different times. So um, right now I'm actually gonna hand it over to our new, our new curator, Jenny Wright. Um, she's been working with me on this call to action and I'll just let her give herself a little introduction and talk about the aquarium really quick. Hey everyone, so thanks for the introduction there Vic. Um, yeah, I am Jenny, I'm the new curator down at the Nicholas Sontag Marine Education Centre and I am super excited to be a part of this community aquarium. I'll keep it quite short and sweet um, so that you can get on with your night as well. But my, um, I just wanted to kind of encourage anyone that can um, safely, of course, under the current COVID guidelines, to come down and check out the aquarium and our new collection of local species, as well as our call to action corner that myself and Vic have been hard at work collecting resources for um, and to encourage you to get involved with our citizen scientist um, initiative that we have going. Um, I believe Vic has um, kind of a way that you can sign up virtually as well that she will talk about in a second but you can come down to the aquarium and check out um, our amazing corner that is full of resources that have also been guided by this amazing talk as well. Um, and I'll hand you back over to Vic quickly to, to find out how you can get involved virtually in this, this hard COVID time. Great, thanks Jenny. Um, yeah, so we're open, the aquarium's open on Saturdays and Sundays from 10 to five. Um, if you're ever curious about that, you can check out our website or our Facebook page. We'll be giving updates about our hours. Um, if they will be changing, uh, we're just following guidelines for now. Um, so this slide here, you can probably all see, it's got a big QR code on it. Um, if you're new to QR codes, it's pretty easy. Uh, just take your smartphone and open up your camera. Uh, you just have to hold your camera over the QR code and then a little link shows up. You click on that link and it's gonna take you to a registration form um, that you can fill out just to become a citizen scientist under this new program. Uh, basically all that means is that uh, we'll have your email address. We can send you more information about these calls to action, um, how to actually take part, and the next steps. If this QR code uh, isn't for you or it's not working for you, uh, please feel free to email me at co-op at gibsonsmarine-ed.org. It's in the chat too. Thanks, Graham. And I can send it to you personally after this talk tonight. Um, we're really excited about this. Hopefully this is a way we can engage even though we can't be in person. Uh, and I hope those who uh, live nearby can take part. And we will definitely put this up on our Facebook and Instagram as well after the event. Yes, thank you. So um, I'll let Graham talk about our upcoming events and our next speaker series. Hi, 
Yeah, so Garth was the first of many great, uh, turns out either PhDs or PhD candidates that will be providing their expertise over the following uh, three months. So we have, and these may be colleagues of Garth as well, you, you likely know at least um, two of them. Uh, Aroha Miller, who's the Ocean Watch manager for OceanWise, so she's the editor of the Ocean Watch report. Uh, she'll be doing a fantastic pres presentation on the last sort of 40 years of data gathering and the research that's come out of um, the house sound science and citizen science that's been happening. Uh, more details are pending on all of these speakers as to their exact subject matter of their talks. And then we will have um, Fiona Beattie, who wears many hats in the marine conservation uh, sector here on the uh, west coast of BC, but one of these, she'll be speaking as the project director for Make Way, uh, which leads up the House Sound Marine Reference Guide, which is a spatial mapping uh, program that allows for management decisions. But I think she may be talking about citizen science initiatives. That Marine Reference Guide came out of the Ocean Watch report recommendations. So it's a good arc to go from a very specific thing that Garth is talking about to a slightly broader, longer horizon that Aroha is in, in responsible for to the bigger initiative that's expanding that Fiona's part of that's going to lead to management decisions. And then we're going to uh, end up with uh, Andres, who I don't know personally, but he will be speaking about sort of what we call the blue economy now. So this is going to be really, really interesting, right? It's like, how do we mobilize this knowledge to change the way we do business? Uh, it, as one of the many approaches that we're going to need to solve these super wicked product problems of uh, climate change and ecological disasters that may approach through our human activities. Um, thanks to everyone for your time tonight. Uh, we had over 40 people participate and many of those were in couples. So for our first shot at this, having 60 or 70 people come and listen to a scientist talking on a Wednesday night in an absolutely pouring rain where we are and, and is, is great. Everyone's going to drive home safely because they're probably already there. Garth, we would normally buy you a beer or a, a celebrate perhaps a bit more jovially than today. Um, I do have an idea of how we can celebrate you, so please do sign up for our newsletter um, because I think what we'll do is we can put a little bit of a special mention in there. Uh, so we'll follow up with you on that. And I just uh, appreciate you um, leading the charge and being the putting your hand up to go first. Uh, and all of our board members that are on the call today, Dave, David, Mary, Pam, Debbie, Errol, Thanks for supporting our organization as volunteer leads. It's, it's truly appreciated. Um, anybody else that I missed, Rainer, the, the whole team. Uh, Emily Cook, too, you'll see her name in there. She's our education coordinator who runs all our K-12 programming. So we, are, we have a great team. And in just you know three short years, we've come a long way. So uh, anybody who ever wants to get in contact with me or wants to be, contribute to our organization, either through volunteering or you know, financially or through participation as an expert, please do get in touch. It's, it's super great. So Garth, thanks again. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much folks. Uh, keep updates, uh, keep up with us on Facebook and uh, I hope you all have a safe night and I guess we can sign off. Thanks everyone. Take care. Maybe we can unmute and say goodbye. Thanks guys. Thanks. Bye. 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 Everyone, Bye. thank you, Garth. Thanks, Bye. Bye. Thank you, Garth. 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 Thank you,